Trouble Magazine would like to thank its sponsors. Ararat Gallery Tama, Bendigo Living Art Space, Fox Galleries Melbourne, Manningham Gallery, Swan Hill Regional Art Gallery, Wangaratta Art Gallery and Western Sydney University. Thanks for your support. What if a conversation could change your mind about yourself and about the world? What if a conversation could one day lead to a change in government policy? I'm Dr Mark Halloran, and you're listening to Deep Trouble. And so, here we are, back in the studios of Main FM, time for Deep Trouble. And Mark's with me once again. One of the themes that has emerged in the first series and also in the second series is your desire to understand Islam and to find a constructive way of framing a discussion about it. Would that be fair to say, Mark? Yes, I think that sounds fair. I mean, I've always been interested to some extent in the history and philosophy of Islam. So I'm interested in the Arabic transmission, so the transmission of Aristotle's work and some of the Neoplatonic thinkers such as Plotinus and the influence that that's had on the West in terms of science, uh, medical science, uh, chemistry and our numerical system and the influence of those philosophers, people like Avicenna, as he's known in the West, or, or Ibn Sina. Uh, right. and, and how that, that philosophy has influenced Western thought. Well, you've found a fabulous guest to interview, Professor Mehmet Altsap. I'll just run through his qualifications. Associate Professor Mehmet Altsap is a theologian, author and academic and a founding director of the Centre for Islamic Studies and Civilization at CSU. He's a public intellectual who writes for the conversation. Well, I'll tell you what, Mark, you don't ever shy away from asking a difficult question first up. I found it a very interesting interview, and I'm sure our listeners will enjoy it. So let's have a listen to Dr. Mark Haller in conversation with Associate Professor Mehmet Alsap. Hello, Mark. Hello, Mehmet. Thanks very much for doing this. Uh, thanks for having me, Mark, uh, in this particular program. I really appreciate it, and I, I hope that um, the discussion is really good. Sure. So I thought I'd begin by asking you about the relationship that you have with your Muslim faith and your conception of God. I have always been a religious person from the age of 10. I guess I'm on a journey. Nobody really pushed me into it. My family was traditional average Turkish family. But when I went to university especially, I started to doubt religion and God, and I realized that my faith was a blind faith. It was quite deep and enjoyable, but I really had no knowledge. And that really began a process of research for me. And I started attending classes and reading books, and particularly I enjoyed or benefited from Said Nursi's theological writings. Uh, they were rational and also at the same time spiritual. It really satisfied my mind. And since my early 20s, I've been practicing religion and be religiously active as well, teaching youth and others along the way. About around 2000, I started first English courses on Islam in Australia. And they kind of took off. I'm really proud to say that I've pioneered some of those courses. And they became really popular. And from 2009 onwards, my relationship with Islam has been more of a scholarly relationship. In addition to my personal, obviously, religiosity, I have engaged with Islam and the topic, subject matters, from a scholarly and then also critical perspective uh, in, in that sense. And I think the journey continues. You've written a book about Islam and the challenges of meeting modernity. I guess. What do you see are the challenges for the Muslim faith in terms of the challenges of meeting modernity from moving from historical, orthodox, conservative culture to adapting, I suppose, to Western culture? Well, I think there's two things that can be said there. Uh, The first one is that when I began that scholarly engagement with Islam, and also at the same time in 2001, I've really been intensely busy or engaging publicly and socially as well since 9-11. So I began to see issues coming out, especially for those Muslims living in Western countries like Australia, 
And whatever book I read that was written in the pre-modern times by great Muslim scholars, there was always a gap between what was written then and what we need now. That's why I called the book, I titled the book, Islam Between Tradition and Modernity. It seems that the Muslims are vacillating between sticking to a traditional scholarship, which is great, by the way, it's very rich, very rewarding, uh, studying those. But there are uh, modern issues uh, that needs addressing. We need to look at issues with a fresh outlook. And when Muslims do that, they tend to swing to the other extreme, where they lose their roots to Islamic scholarship or Islam itself and its source books. So therefore, I thought, uh, I really observed that gap. And in that book, I tried to cover uh, by discussing certain issues. The second aspect of your question is that, is the Western norms the standard upon which we judge everything? I think there's a little bit of hubris in that question that assumes that uh, everything that the Western world has to offer are correct and true, and there's no alternatives, or we have reached the pinnacle of human development and civilization. I live in Australia and benefit from the, the great liberal democracy and the wonderful technological advancement and freedom that is in this country. Certainly, the Western culture and civilization took humanity to new levels of development and progress. But nevertheless, I wouldn't really begin to judge Islam with that. I would think that Islam provides its own epistemological sources or it's an independent uh, a source of knowledge and discourse or literature in a sense that, and I'm not saying, you know, everything there is absolutely true as well. But once we start to compare contrasts without respecting the independent sources of the Western civilization and the Islamic knowledge and scholarship, then we will begin to make the mistakes that I was talking about earlier. What I took away from your book and my own reading is that parts of Western culture could be conceived as rather than Judeo-Christian, uh, Islamo-Christian, because of the golden age within Islam and what they uh, term as uh, the Arabic transmission, where Muslim philosophers translated the works of Aristotle not only translated and transmitted, but, but also deciphered because his works were very, very difficult to understand and read. Uh, and this changed certainly medical science significantly and added to Western culture and added to and was a part of the Age of Enlightenment. That's right. Really, if you go back from 8th century to 16th centuries, that world, it would have been probably like today where the Muslim civilization would be the dominant one and everything would be measured against it, where Muslims led uh, in every aspect of life, uh, yes. culture and civilization, and one of which is the knowledge uh, transmission or knowledge production and transmission. Uh, there is from 750 onwards, uh, that AD, like that eighth, uh, middle of 8th century onwards, the, we see this uh, massive translation that's happening in the uh, Muslim world and gathering of all books that they could find on science philosophy in any field. An institution established House of Wisdom, kind of like a think tank and a massive library and, and all these best scholars and experts, scientists of its time were studying and working there. And they were translating books in massive numbers. And once they translated and studied these books, it had include, you know, uh, Euclid's mathematics, and Ptolemy's astronomy books, and I think Galen's uh, medical writings from the ancient Greeks, including Aristotle later on. And they started examining these books and they found mistakes in it. They tested their the arguments and they found, so hey, these are not true necessarily, or we could add to this. So they started writing original works and really advanced astronomy, physics, uh, chemistry. Actually, the word chemistry comes from alchemia or alchemy that became later alchemy and then it became chemistry. Uh, it's an Arabic word. The word algorithm comes from al-Khawarizmi who wrote a book, the first book on algebra. He actually invented the idea of X, Y, Z, you know, the symbols instead of just working with numbers.
they were building medical instruments that are still used today with slight modification and improvements. Uh, Ibn Sina's canon on medicine was studied for 700 years in the West. And then they built, Muslims built these massive uh, libraries with hundreds and thousands of books, manuscripts in it, uh, especially the ones in Spain, for example, Spain, Sicily. They were under Muslim rule for a long time. And uh, like, for instance, in the city of Granada, there were uh, about a hundred library, each one having hundred thousand or so manuscripts. When in Europe, most of the books were kept in uh, monasteries and abbeys, and maybe there would be a thousand if you're lucky. And then they wouldn't just be religious books mostly. So Muslim really did create a civilization of knowledge and advancement science, commerce as well. And then later when Sicily and Spain fell to Europeans, there was a reverse translation movement. I'm not sure if the listeners know that there's a Adelard of Bath. He's known as the first English scientist. He travels to Muslim world, Antioch. In 1111, this is just 15 years after Crusades, I guess one of the good things that came out of it was it really opened Europeans' eyes to Muslim world, Islamic civilization. Uh, and he travels to Antioch, stays there, learns Arabic, studies for seven years, and then goes back to England with a sack full of books and starts translating. And uh, when these were translated, it really created an alternative literature than what the churches had. And obviously, the church did not like all these books. They were challenging some of the maybe beliefs and what they hold. And then these scientists, early scientists, established their own teaching institutions, which we call now universities. So universities really come from the influence of the Muslim world on Europe. There is definitely a stagnation of Islamic scholarship after 14th century, but that's mainly because of external factors such as crusades, there was a Mongol invasion that was devastating, like they invaded Baghdad in 1258 and sacked the whole city and killed much of the inhabitants. Because Baghdad was the, like New York of today, it was the seat of Muslim civilization. It was destroyed, it never recovered after that. There was a plague, massive plague that hit Europe and Muslim world at the same time. So. There has been these great calamities that hit the Muslim world that really stagnated everything. And then we see a bit of a bouncing back with the Ottomans and the Mughals in India and so on. But they also go for about three centuries or so. And then Europe comes and takes over. You're listening to Deep Trouble. Dr. Mark Halloran in conversation with Associate Professor Mehmet Altsap, Islamic scholar. I suppose one of the most significant points is around World War I and the, the loss of Jerusalem and also the fall of the Ottoman Empire in 1924, I think it was. That kind of, you've described in your book, led to a regress and you talked about some of the things that occurred that sort of led to a regress to some extent within Islamic culture. Yes, the overall the factor was really colonisation. You know, five European powers, including Russia, colonized just about 95% of the Muslim world. Like India was ruled by Muslims. Uh, it was colonized in 1858. Uh, Egypt was colonized in 1882, and so on. You know, I can give you these uh, dates just about everywhere. And the last the bastion of free Muslim lands were the Ottomans, and they kind of lost everything with the World War I in 1918. The loss of Jerusalem is really symbolic of that great loss and colonization of the entire Muslim world. And colonization is very destructive. It not only collapses the political system, but it collapses everything from education, from economy. Uh, uh, just sort of, it's very destructive. And especially if it goes on for 50 years, you kind of lost two generations there. And, and there is a discontinuity of your development and progress. Actually, Muslim world, they were pretty quick at trying to develop and catch up to Europe. Most yes. people don't know that the Ottoman Empire, they established the first parliament in 1876, you know, and they built the railroad. Railroad was the kind of like latest technological investment and sign of 
being civilized and developed, you know, they built Istanbul to Medina Railroad in the late 1800s. And they opened up universities, factories, and even Suez Canal was built in 1869 by Muslims. And then, uh, again, uh, British comes and colonizes. And Suez Canal, by the way, was the main reason. And even when you go back in as early as 1820s, or even before that, the Ottomans did a massive study and saying, why are Europeans seem to be developing? And they analyzed and produced reports and they took action. But I would think that if it wasn't for colonization of the Muslim world, they wouldn't have been in this position right now. They would have mm. been developed countries. The Ottoman Empire as well would have partaken in colonization of itself, and as did the Muslim world. So do you mean the Muslims colonize others? Yes, for various different reasons. Like uh, There are different reactions in terms of when they reach Spain, they're hailed as liberators because uh, the Jewish population prefer the rule to Christianity. There is a difference, though. Yeah, of course, you know, the world has always been... People have wars and they conquer places. That's always been there. But the difference between colonization and the Muslims' expansion, as you all... Let's say even you can use the word invasion... Really, what happened afterwards? Like Muslims, for example, rule half of Africa for centuries, but they have developed these countries. They haven't seen the population as they have subjugated themselves to Muslims or these rulers. So Muslims haven't seen themselves as invaders or subjugators. They saw themselves as liberators, and they developed these countries. I'm not justifying that military wars or invasion, but uh, yes. the, the mindset was very different. Whereas the, the modern colonization was more like uh, seeing these places as markets or where we, you got resources, you took raw material from there and took it to your factories and then produced products and sold them in these countries cheaply. It was very different. And uh, it, it's also not just Muslims, but other people in the past, like Romans, Romans are uh, kind of where they went to, they built roads, and they kind of developed wherever they were, even though it really depends on what happens afterwards. I think it's important mm -hmm. to, to talk about this because, well, and it, it's correct to some extent, like we're talking about, is that the Islamic faith spreads out after the death of Muhammad and his cousin Ali through military campaigns, so it's religion spread by the sword. Certainly Muslims conquered lands through military power or wars. And I'm not going to go into the reasons for these things. However, Islam did not spread by those wars. It actually took a process of three centuries. There's a really good book by Ira Lapidus, you know, History of Muslim Societies. It's a pretty 900-page book. He discusses in great length the diffusion of Islam in the world. And he says that actually the mass conversions took place in 10th century onwards. The reason is that there's a very clear verse in the Quran, La uh, I'll just even give you the Arabic version, which means there's no compulsion in religion. So even if you conquer the place, you can't subjugate or force people into converting to Islam. And that's why actually the local indigenous populations saw Muslims as kind of liberators sometimes because to them, you know, it was not Byzantines or Romans or Sasanians ruled or and then Muslims came, it was no different as long as they were free and Muslims were better than those others in that sense. I'm not saying, you know, they were perfect, but they were better. And the only yes. time when these early, in the early expansion of Islam, when they had a lot of resistance was in the Turkish lands in Central Asia because there were no empires in those areas. So when Muslim armies went there, they had to fight the indigenous people, and they really vehemently resisted. Whereas in the other places, it was just these empires being replaced. So, so the, the, the dynamic, historical dynamic was really different, and certainly Muslims did not force people into converting Islam. But they did, yeah, conquer lands through military force. The interesting thing about Islam is the uh, proclamation of kinship of all people. But 
what you were talking about in terms of that not forcing religion, it seems as though that's changed in modern times or what we call modern times now. How would it change? In terms of you talk about moderates and, and puritanical, uh, the difference between moderates and puritanical Muslims. Mm. And so if you go to a place like Afghanistan and the, the Taliban who are trained in madrasas and Taliban ruling between 1996 and 2001 and, and some of the mm. genocides they commit uh, and the, the enforcement of religion in terms of women's dress, uh, read about them blacking out the windows of buildings so people can't look in to see women. It seems as though that, that idea of not enforcing religion in terms of at a local level in current times has changed for certain groups. Well, as Karen Armstrong says in her book, you know, the fundamentalism, religious fundamentalisms, she says that there's a fundamentalist strain in every religion, you know, in Judaism, Christianity, Buddhism and Islam as well. For example, there are fundamentalist Buddhists in Myanmar who are at the moment doing almost ethnic cleansing, you know, with the, the Muslims in Myanmar. Uh, they are Buddhists. And yes. You don't expect that. So that kind of fundamentalism strain is it's a minority strain in religions, but it's always there. It seems to be a human problem. Some people are just prone to that level of understanding of religion. You know, we have um, Cromwell in England. His Puritanism was atrocious. You know, there's, there's these uh, Puritans in Germany that captured these towns, and if a woman wore a short dress, they would burn them in stakes. You know, it was terrible, those things, and that's fundamentalism. So I guess we are, Muslim world is also discovering some of that today. And I certainly disagree with Taliban and their. I believe that they misunderstand religion and the implementation of government or even religious rules were very simplistic and harsh. And even, like for example, Prophet Muhammad's wife Aisha he said that whenever the Prophet Muhammad had an option in a matter, options, he always chose the easier one for people. Like he didn't choose the harsh one. The moderate one. Yeah, yeah. 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 I've got a book actually on my desk right now. It says the case for moderation in Islam, the Quranic case. It, Islam is really a moderate religion. That's its character. So extremism is the aberration of Islam. But even at the time of Prophet Muhammad himself, there were some extreme people. You know, the, He heard that three people, one of them said, I'm going to fast every day. The other one said, I'm going to be celibate. Another one says, I'm never going to sleep at night. I'll always pray at night. And when the prophet heard of this, he actually called them and gave them a lecture and said, this is not Islam. And, you know, I sleep. I have a wife. You know, I eat sometimes. I fast. He would fast a lot, but not every day. So he said, this is my way. If you don't follow this, you're not one of us. So basically, he was saying, if you're extreme, you're not one of us and you're not Islamic as such. But that's not Islam. So I think this extremism idea, if you ask the Taliban people, they'll say that you are extreme, you know, in your... It's kind of also a little bit relative. And you have to also keep in mind that Afghanistan has been a war-torn country for uh, four decades. You can hardly expect that not only... Uh, you know, religious people, they will not be the perfect Muslims or progress Muslims. And even non-religious Afghans, the corruption is huge there. Like, we all hear stories. And uh, it, it's a country that's troubled by invasions, civil war. And I think that they need help rather than criticism. You're listening to Deep Trouble. Dr Mark Halloran in conversation with Associate Professor Mehmet Altsap, Islamic scholar. I've made the point uh, myself in a previous interview with Benjamin Gilmore, who, who made a film uh, in Afghanistan called Jirga, and we talked about the mixture of Islamic values and Pashtun values, tribal values, but that's essentially the Taliban, and it's not to make an apology, is a children of war of the Soviet-Afghan war. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and so, you, you know, harsh conditions often produce 
harsh people and harsh ideologies, I think. And that's not to apologise for that. That's just to make an observation of that. I guess the issue is in terms of the challenges for people in arguing a case of moderate Islam is that the arguments that are made from people like the New Atheists Sam Harris, the Richard Dawkins, like Christopher Hitchens, uh, and even in um, a book called The Way of the Strangers, uh, which looked at uh, ISIS, is that saying that extreme versions of religion, because we know that fundamentalism, as you said, occurs in every religion, and that people suffer because of zealotry and the small group of people that become God's madmen. But the, the extreme versions of religion are also plausible versions of religion. And I wonder what your take on that would be. Well, the way I approach this is, uh, or extremism in general, is fundamentally religion is about, or Islam, let's say, is about submitting yourself to a set of beliefs and practices, and you hope to improve yourself spiritually, mentally, and sometimes even physically. So that there's a level of surrender or submission, or you have to be coachable by religion, but if you don't do that, if you just go into it looking at it from your own perspective, you end up transforming it into who you are. And I see in these fundamentalist strains that phenomena. They wear an identity of Islam, but it's really who they are right now, which is unpurified, undeveloped, the pure ego or the carnal desires and translate into religious sanctions and so on. Uh, it's really a concoction of religion. I completely disagree. You can't say that there is a false doctor and he goes and treats some patients in Alaska or something. And then we catch that person and we say, ah, his version of medicine is also valid. That's preposterous. So I think we have to be careful with that. And uh, that's what the atheistic writers fall into uh, because their argument against religion is always they show these bad examples. I've seen it in you know, God delusions of Richard Dawkins as well. Uh, you know, they always show these bad examples from Muslims, Hindus, Buddhists, and saying all religion are bad. But they are always a minority, and you can show a lot of very positive examples and what religions say. But sometimes I meet people... Uh, for example, they say, oh, Islam is really bad. I read Quran, I read Hadith, the Prophet Muhammad's sayings. It was terrible. <laughs> My reaction to that is, can you tell me, if you read the Quran, if you read all this material, can you tell me something that you really saw as good? There's no answer to that, because either they're lying, they haven't read everything, or they yes. read it with a extreme polemical mindset. So they couldn't see anything good. So I personally think place. that uh, uh, Richard Dawkins and Hitchens, they are polemists against religion in general, and Islam in particular. And they have the arguments and points and right. You know, what they criticize of religious people are correct. I am critical of that as well, as a person of theologian. You know, I reject Taliban as much as Richard Dawkins does. So really, I think that the only distinction is that I don't see Islam as fundamentally flawed. I see human beings as fundamentally flawed. And that religion is an instrument really there to help human beings. Religion should never be the subject matter of human endeavor. It, it should help humans. The really subject matter is human being and how we can improve ourselves in this world. I think when I spoke to Tim Costello, he made the point that it is the marrying of religion or ideology with power that corrupts. So the, the desire for political power. But what about atheists who use political power, like Hitler or something? Oh, that, that's ideology, a marrying of any ideology yeah. with power. That's it. I, I yeah. think ideology is the problem. It, it can if you be. make religion into ideology, you're going to corrupt it. I'm also interested because I know that, you know, within Palestine, before the great catastrophe, uh, I spoke to a Palestinian refugee, Dr. Olfab Mahmoud, who talked about Christians and Jews and, and Muslims all living in peace with each other, as they mostly did during Islamic times when, when Islam had spread out from 1630 onwards, that, that mostly people lived generally in peace with each other. I suppose from a theological perspective, I've always wondered that 
people almost have to get past theology to do that to some extent. Yes and no. Yes, in a sense that we start seeing, when we interact with people of other religions, we start seeing some universal aspects in our religion as well, as theirs. We see the commonalities. Uh, I've been yes. in, involved in Interfaith Dialogue for a long time. I actually established Affinity Intercultural Foundation in 2000 just for that purpose. And I have been engaged with people of other religions, you know, Christian Jews and, and Hindus and others. And what came out was actually I felt that I was enriched even deeper level in my own tradition, as well as seeing some common elements and respecting other people and their beliefs, even yes. though I disagree with, you know, certain things, theological things and others, ethical aspects maybe. But the experience of that interfaith dialogue is really beneficial, extremely beneficial. Uh, on one hand, you see your religion as universal. On the other, you go deeper into it. And I, I, that's been the experience of everybody that I've met over the years. You're listening to Deep Trouble. Dr. Mark Halloran in conversation with Associate Professor Mehmet Altsap, Islamic scholar. I think that certainly there's a commonality across uh, monotheistic Abrahamic religions in terms of a shared history and prophets. There's a, essentially a shared idea around resurrection. And in fact, uh, Muslims and Jews share the same idea around a material bodily resurrection rather than an idea of spirit, which sort of comes from the Greek. But I often think at a theological level, it's very difficult to get across certain things. So the crucifixion of Jesus, for example, would be very difficult, a Muslim perspective on that, or some Muslim perspectives on that, would be very difficult for a lot of Christians to accept. One idea is that he didn't die on the cross and that he was uh, replaced and, and he escaped. And you can see that that would be difficult for Christians to understand and, and accept. And also the idea that the Trinity, you know, which is a Catholic idea, or Godhead, uh, is a sort of a form of polytheism, which is a Muslim view. Yeah, so what's the point with that then? I mean that at a theological level, doesn't that sometimes, because some ideas are incommensurate, and if, if you were approaching it from a strictly theological perspective, doesn't it make it difficult to make those connections? And that you ha actually have to get away from theology to a certain extent to find the commonalities of experience as Christian people, as Muslim people? I disagree. Well, yes, maybe at common level, you, when you're interacting socially, you know, in the same society, you, you, yes, you know, you don't want to see someone's religious identity in order to function well, you know, see everybody as citizen, like in Australia. But that's really, that's not an ideal state, and also it's by default happens that way. But when we interact at the theological level, I see three things happen. The first thing is, because we hold these differences, you know, Muslims are, or Christians, let's say, let's take those as examples, there is really prejudice, even though people are polite to one another in society. There is prejudice in yes. the back of the mind. So the moment you interact at the religious level, or let's say dialogue, you immediately see commonality. Uh, commonality at a different sort emerges, which is, ah, well, you see God as merciful, and we also see God's grace and mercy, uh, compassion as well. Oh, okay, well, we've got something in common. Uh, that's been my, uh, the experiences of people, I've done research in this as well, they immediately, yes. the first encounter is of immediate seeing commonalities. And then that builds trust. So when you have trust, then you can talk about differences in a respectful way without kind of attacking one another, but with an intention to understand. I held very deep discussions with priests and Christian theologians, and I was critical of certain Christian aspects, and they were critical of Muslim beliefs yes. and positions, and we weren't offending one another because we built trust. And when you do that, when you at that level of discussion, what you have to do is you have to really understand what you hold as a Muslim or what you hold as a Christian. For instance, let's say Trinity, right? Muslims believe in one God, and they're not going to know usually a very deep understanding of that. But when you start talking about Trinity and one God concept, 
you're forced to go into detail and understand yours uh, in a far more deeper level. This is what I mean by enrichment. And you feel enriched. Oh, well, I didn't know that about my own faith. But in that process, you, you're also a little bit altered because you understand the other a little bit differently or you see their point of view and you are more accommodating in a sense that, oh, okay, well, Christians believe in Trinity, but it's not just a blind faith. There is a rationale behind it, kind of. Even though, again, once again, I, I may disagree at the theological level, but at least I understand what Christian theologians talk about. So that actually gives you a greater level of acceptance, in my view. I suppose that's what I was wondering, and, and what you've answered essentially in terms of trust, but you, you come at it from fundamental values. So if we, if we approach this conversation from the fundamental values of, of our belief system, which may be around love and peace, then we can withstand some of those differences in ideas, and that won't affect our relationship necessarily as, as humans relating to one another. I suppose that's a, the other issue is that we see when people talk about Islamophobia and obviously there is bigotry towards uh, Muslim people but that's often conflated with any sort of critical observation about Islam as a belief system. So, so I mean, can you be critical of Islam in certain areas and not be Islamophobic? But you can. Uh, and uh, by the way, the Western scholars have been doing that for 200 years. And there's been some who have an axe to grind against Islam, and then the others have really genuinely engaged uh, at a scholarly, intellectual level. Uh, and that has changed in 2001 with the 9-11. We call that Orientalism in general. I actually landed in my email today a book called titled New Orientalism Post-9-11. I'm really interested to see what that book argues. So it's been happening in the Western world far more than what Muslims have been, you know, critical of uh, Christian theology or Western civilization. I think the mistake that is made by critics of Islam is that they begin to see Islam as a problem. And that really is highly offensive to Muslims because they don't see Islam that way. Like, I agree that, for example, women have been treated not very well in the modern times uh, in the Muslim countries, societies. I, I agree with that. Yes. And some people may even justify it with religious arguments. But I still, I don't see Islam as a problem. I see that Muslims' understanding of Islam is an issue. So th there's that critical difference. And also, the, the, another mistake that is made by non-Muslim critics of Islam is that they generalize, uh, like all Muslims are potential terrorists, so all Muslims yes. have these issues, something must be wrong with these Muslims. So it is those things that are irrational explanations or ideas that are Islamophobic. It's a criticism of the entire culture. Yeah, the entire religion or entire people being uh, putting them, generalizing them, uh, and sometimes dehumanizing that, that's the problem. And there are some Muslims, like Aryan Hirsi Ali, for example, Irshad Manji, they were Muslims and then they are so critical that they actually leave the religion. So that does no good. Again, Muslims, they start becoming defensive when these things happen. You know, that's the last thing you want. You, mm -hmm. We want Muslims to improve, change. They need help, you know, the Muslims need to be engaged at a level where, look, what, how can we help you? And what can we learn from you? Sometimes you got to even say that. Yes. And uh, so that people can become, be more uh, open to learning from others. So that's my reflection on that particular point. Yes, well, I guess because I grew up a Catholic and I know that at a grassroots level that criticism of the religion as I was growing up and it was the most dominant religion in the world at that particular point in terms of numbers, I think the numbers have changed now in Islam is actually the most populous religion in the world. But I certainly remember that myself and my family at that time were, were deeply offended because our understanding of criticism would have been, well, we, we had an emotional connection to the religion, and, and the religious idea was that religion often is can place itself beyond criticism. Yeah, again, it'll be different. Like, for example, 
the textual or biblical criticism really started in 19th century in Europe, in the Christian world. Yes. Whereas Muslims were doing that in 8th century yes. onwards. That they were critical of their sources. And even these but, hadith reports from Prophet Muhammad, yes. there's a whole discipline that's developed, hadith criticism. The scholars wanted to know whether these reports that were attributed to Prophet Muhammad, were they actually true? And they looked at who's reporting it, their lives, and when they claimed that they got it from this other person, that that was actually true. They examined the text, and they produced, you know, they rejected a lot of reports it's on the grounds that they were not sound and and sometimes even openly fabricated. So I think the case of Muslim scholarship is a little bit different than that. Yes. But obviously these scholars weren't fundamentally criticizing Islam as a non-true, they were believers. But still they were looking at texts as critically, perhaps we can say a friendly criticism or scholarly criticism rather than polemical criticism. You're listening to Deep Trouble. Dr. Mark Halloran in conversation with Associate Professor Mehmet Altsap, Islamic scholar. You've talked about the relationship between Islam and, and women, particularly in modern times, but there seems to be a challenge in terms of moderate approach in uh, uh, interpretation of texts such as the Surah An Nisa 434, which seems to condone domestic violence against wives who are not doing what their husbands want. Yeah, th- well, that's right. That verse is put forward a lot by uh, many people saying Islam or Quran is teaching violence against women or therefore it condones domestic violence. But once again, I disagree. And let me explain, because I think this is very important. I don't usually get a lot of time in interviews to tackle this particular verse. Sure, this is very important. But I would like to have that opportunity here. Sure. My first point is that Islam does not condone domestic violence in general, because there are many other verses in the Quran and also sayings of Prophet Muhammad that actually promote good treatment of women. For example, Prophet Muhammad said that the, the best amongst you are the ones who are best in conduct, and the best of those are the ones who treat women the best. So he put good treatment of women right up the top of good character. And he even sometimes heard people beating their wives, and he gave a sermon, quite an angry sermon, saying, what's wrong with you? You know, you beat your women and then sleep with them at night. How can you do that? And Quran talks about you know, the relationship between men and women, or married men and women, as uh, one of tranquility, and which is based on love and compassion, as the ideal relationship, that women and men are garments of one another. The Quran says uh, women are, have rights over men, and men have rights over women. So I can go on and on. I think these examples and evidence says that Islam does not condone domestic violence or yes. it promotes good treatment of women. Now, let's go with that in our mind. Uh, let's try to, I think it's possible to understand that verse in two ways. Because the first way is that it means divorcing. The key word there is daraba in Arabic. And daraba in Arabic is like uh, the word get in English. You know, if you open the English dictionary, you'll have one page meanings of get. It's like that. That word has a lot of meanings. Yes. Uh, daraba. Daraba interpreted within the actual surah. So there's multiple... Yeah, yeah I'll, I'll come to that. I'll sure. come to that. The verse is talking about it says, if there's a serious problem between men and women, or your wife, let's say. There's another verse, by the way, that says to a woman, if you have a big problem with your husband, do this, this, this. That's kind of equal in that sense. You could conceivably have a problem with your wife, or a wife can have a big problem with her husband. So what do you do in those cases? So Islam is a practical religion. It needs to give practical answers. And also, these verses were revealed 7th century, so it needs to be applicable then and later on as well. So what the verse says is that if you've got this serious problem with your wife, then talk first. And then, if that's not doing anything good, separate your bed. And if that's not doing anything good, then idrabuhunna, the Arabic word, uh, and that's usually translated as beating. But let me ask you, you know, if you've got this problem with your wife, and 
you're pretty good, let's say, because yes. that's what the example is. And you're going to talk, that's not going to solve. You're going to separate your bed, that's not going to solve. Do you think beating is going to solve it? It really means strike them out. So the word is like strike out, meaning divorce. So you've got a serious problem. Your talk doesn't address. You separate the beds. It doesn't help. What are you going to do next? What's the natural? You're going to separate. You're going to have to yes. divorce, right? So actually, we have an example of that with Prophet Muhammad when his wives sort of kind of complain about their living standards. They were living very poor. And he actually practiced this particular verse. He spoke to them, they were the same, and he separated himself for a month. And then he said, if you guys are not going to change, I'm going to divorce you. So his practice was what I was saying, divorce. It wasn't beating. Mm -hmm. Yes, some classic scholars understood that as beating, and they saw the problem with that, and that's why they said, oh, it's a symbolic, you take a little toothpick, like a toothbrush, and just symbolically hit it. Well, what's mm -hmm. that going to solve? Yes. You know, and I sort of disagree with that. The second uh, way of understanding the verse is you could say that it's actually addressing domestic violence in a way that it introduces two other measures. So it's really playing with the psychology of a man who's prone to domestic violence. Let's mm -hmm. say we understand it that way, right? Domestic violence has always been there, and it is in Australia right now. Like yes. A lot of uh, and we know that, right? Yes. Uh, it's a so, cultural culture. So, and usually what happens, men usually beat their wives when they get really angry, for whatever the reason. I'm not justifying that. But that's how it happens. So if you tell a guy when they get angry and just they're just about to beat their wife, and you say, look, you've got, you got to talk first. And then you have to separate your bed. So by the time he does all of that, his anger is gone. So he's not going to actually beat his wife after that. So we can say that that verse is really playing with the men who are prone to violence. It's not telling them, don't hit them. Yes. It's just saying, talk first and separate your bed. But by the time that happens, it's, it's gone. Right. I don't know anybody, to be honest, who follows that and then ends up beating their wives. I've never seen it. Even take a toothpick and hit. It's yeah, they're, just they're, theoretical. They're, they're, it doesn't happen in the reality. And by the way, the Muslim men, like when they become religious, they become better to their wives and their children. And even Prophet Muhammad, he said, the worst man is when he comes to the house and the kids and the wife looks for a place to hide. But the best man is that when he enters a house, the household rejoices, kids and wife. And so obviously that's a person that is kind and gentle and you know, looks after the whole family. So I think, uh, once again, with that verse, uh, 434, it's how you look at it. If you're uh, Richard Dawkins, he's going to look at it as, ah, there you go, Islam teaches domestic violence, therefore it's a bad religion. Look, yes. it's in the Quran. Uh, but I look at it, again, as a, what is this really verse telling us? And what is it trying to address? And how is it addressing? How can we analyze the words properly, you know, within proper Arabic language, and also its rationale. And then we see that it's really trying to address domestic violence, and it's actually improving the situation that was there at that time. I think that progressive nature of Islam is a little bit lost. Really, when we look at Quran, Prophet Muhammad's practices, whatever it teaches, it improved that issue in its time, and really progresses forward. So we could say that there has to be this continual progress and improvement. And sometimes I think Muslims are guilty of leaving that and freezing things in time. And, and then you get into a situation where, like Taliban, you know, they come in power and they want to implement Islamic law. And Islamic law was the most sophisticated legal system a thousand years ago. But now they try to apply the books written you know, hundreds of years ago. And then it looks medieval, you know. Yes. So it's not Islam's fault, it's those people's fault that misunderstood some of the things. To me, it seems that it can also be understood in terms of historical time and place. So there are uh, rules and laws aside from the Ten Commandments within the Torah in terms of stoning adulterers or stoning homosexual people. And you could see that as just something that occurred culturally in a particular place, and it is in no way a recommendation of what should occur now. That's right. There was definitely a setting, cultural setting, 
Even Prophet Muhammad recognized that when he was sending a religious leader to Yemen in his time, when they became Muslim, he said, what are you going to do if you find issues that are not covered in Quran or my example? He said, I'll use my best judgment and the equity of people in mind. So this has led Muslim scholars to say that there are certain higher objectives in Islam and or Islamic law that has to be satisfied. If you approach it that way, like prevention of domestic violence, then it's very good. We talk about the Age of Enlightenment and and we've talked about how uh, the Golden Age of Islam actually contributed through the translation and transmission of those Greek philosophers and the ideas that were added by Islamic philosophers to the Enlightenment. But what do you see the relationship between Islam and modernity and post-modernity and the future of it in the, in the West? It's a big question. I really think that Muslims have been trying to modernize, as I gave earlier examples of Ottoman Empire, trying to modernize with railroads and parliament, and they even produce modern legislation uh, in 19th century, uh, but it was kind of derailed when they collapsed, and then Muslim world was colonized, and it took 50 years to free post World War Two, and then there were Cold War, Muslims were caught in between, and you know societies don't develop overnight; it takes sometimes takes centuries. But I don't think Muslims will take that long. There are modern Muslim societies now: Turkey, Dubai pretty modern, maybe not like Australia, but nevertheless, they have their own modernity. Today, we talk about multiple modernities, and I think that Muslims are trying, or they will produce their own modernity. Once again, maybe the the common elements of democracy, human rights, you know, freedom, and those things will become the cornerstone of those uh, the modernities. But it may be like uh, Japan, for example. We can't say Japan is not modern but it's not exactly the same as the Western modernity. Having said that, I think Muslims will also be critical of, or they are critical of modernity, which once again, it means they will develop their own version of it as a result of that. If we look at some of the basis of Western culture in terms of Greek thought and philosophy, self-criticism and criticism of, of Western culture, which is not homogenous either. It's it's made up of, as you've said, it's Judeo-Christian, Islamo-Christian, it's heterogeneous. We should be looking and criticising our own cultures and having goodwill in our critique. If we critique other cultures or if we critique our own, there should be a, a sense of goodwill in that. That's right, that's right. And also the Western culture is also, and civilization is also in developing. It's not standing still. Just the social media has changed our society so much. We don't actually realize now, it's only been 10 years or so, but go forward 30 years, it's not going to be recognizable. So, and Muslim world is also going through the similar transitions. Internet, social media is transforming Muslim societies as well. I guess that's a continual interaction and process. As to where I see the future of Islam, I am hopeful, but at the same time, I'm a bit cautious as well, because there's fundamental flaws in human nature, I think, that really drags us back sometimes. So I feel that human beings are great, but we also have a, you know, evil side and bad side and selfish side that is attracted to that power. Uh, a bit like, you know, the Star Wars, you know, you've got the Jedi and the Sith. That really represents the, the goodness in human humanity and also the, the worst in humanity as well. So for as long as that will be there in human nature, I don't think we will be able to produce perfect society or perfect world. It will always be a struggle. And the main thing is which side we're on. You know, we have to make it clear where we stand in that. Uh, and I'm, I'm standing on the path of approaching things with uh, compassion, constructive uh, criticism, build things up rather than destroy things and continually work on optimizing the conditions that humanity is in and the planet that we live in. But it will not be perfect. And therefore, by extension, Muslims will not be perfect. But I think they will be better than where they are now, definitely. And Muslims in the West in particular will play a critical role because they are producing a hybrid, a different modernity in its own right.
and that is influencing the Muslim world as well. And the numbers of Muslims will increase in, in the Western world, maybe some migration, some conversion, but largely by birth. In Australia, there will be 1 million Muslims by 2023. There are 18 million Muslims in Europe. So these numbers will stay and, and they can only increase. But also these Muslims are homegrown and they're born here and they embrace Australian identity. Uh, they feel they belong to the people and the land of Australia or whatever country they're living in. As long as they feel welcome and they are made to feel belonging to Australia, then they will really contribute to Australian society in, in a unique way, I believe. Yes. Thank you. Thank you for your time. Thank you for the opportunity. And so there it was, Dr. Mark Halloran in conversation with Professor Mehmet Altsa. Mark, during the interview, you and Professor Altsa examined the Quran and Nisa 434, which, as you say, appears to condone domestic violence against disobedient wives. But wouldn't you say that the Old Testament is resplendent with examples of behaviour which would be considered morally reprehensible today, and that even the New Testament leaves a lot to be desired when you compare it to contemporary social expectations around gender relationships? I've made comment about the Old Testament Leviticus mm-hmm. in terms of stoning people to death who yes. are homosexuals, and certainly uh, the Quran, the Hadiths get the same sorts of criticisms. Mm-hmm. So basically what happens is, and why the focus is on Islam, is that with the fall, I suppose, of the Ottoman Empire in the early 20th century and the end of its caliphate, Islamic culture and civilization was on the decline. And so after the Enlightenment, European civilization had increased immeasurably in terms of all sorts of things, in terms of democracy and its treatment of women and the end of slavery and all that sort of thing. The reason that Islam comes under scrutiny is because there are numerous examples uh, within you know Iran theocracies essentially that are Islamic theocracies which are retrograde in terms of treatment of women democracy freedom of expression so it's more of a historical thing but you can understand why those criticisms arise Turkey up until recently has been the success story as a moderate example of what Islam can be in terms of a state But certainly the issues for Islam or Islamic countries or countries run under theocracies is a recent one since the the disintegration of the Ottoman Caliphate. And Mehmet's contention is that Islamic civilization was not always like this, that it had a high point during the Golden Age. Now, there are other people who criticise that, Sam Harris, I think, but I don't think their criticisms are very academic. Does that seem fair? Yeah, no, I can understand that. The second series continues next week when you're going to be talking to Jessica Trisco darden She's a Canadian academic activist and she's an assistant professor of international affairs at School of International Service at American University and a Jean Kirkpatrick Fellow at the American Enterprise Institute. A very interesting woman who has a lot to say about the role of women in combat. Don't you think? That's her main focus in the interview. She's written a book about Kurdish women within the Kurdish rebel forces and their role within uh, the military. I think it's like 50% of the military is made up of, of women and they're fought against ISIS in Syria. But a lot of the interview, or one of the main focuses of the interview, is the repatriation or the potential issues with the repatriation of the women, the brides of ISIS. So join us next week here on Deep Trouble. Mark mm. Halloran in conversation with Jessica Triscadarden. Deep Trouble is produced by Steve Charman in the studios of Maine FM, Castle, Maine. Trouble Magazine would like to thank its sponsors. Ararat Gallery Tama, Bendigo Living Art Space, Fox Galleries Melbourne, Manningham Gallery, Swan Hill Regional Art Gallery, Wangaratta Art Gallery and Western Sydney University. Thanks for your support.